was movie pass back in 2019 i think that was 2019 not not 2020 during the pandemic it was actually two years ago movie pass had released its weird program of allowing you unlimited visits to the movie theater for a fixed monthly price which i think was like 10 or 20 dollars a month the beta was like 50 and it was a really interesting concept and you know that some people were going to go to the movies a lot and it didn't seem like MoviePass had a agreement with the actual theaters. It seemed like they were actually acting sort of in competition with the theaters. Yeah, they were sending people to the theaters more, but MoviePass's business model seemed to be, we'll charge everybody a monthly fee, and then we know some people won't actually get to that many movies, so those people will subsidize the people who go a lot, and somehow MoviePass will make a profit in the meantime and i think they overextended themselves because then we had this whole sort of scandal of movie pass doing some underhanded things to slow the bleeding of their money as they realized that the economics were not going to work out at the level of subscription they were charging but once you've made an agreement with people to charge 10 or 20 dollars a month or something unless you have it built into your contract that you can change the subscription price from month to month and even if you do it still looks bad when people are thinking they got a deal for 10 or 20 dollars and then it goes up to 50 dollars a month people will revolt and revolt that they did i think the whole world was up in arms movie pass started doing things like resetting passwords denying the app that was used to authorize your movie pass card wouldn't work even though you were at the theater so that all resulted in MoviePass declaring bankruptcy, I think it was about a year ago. And now, for some reason, two years later, the Federal Trade Commission has announced that it has sued MoviePass and definitely grab your popcorn, but this also has a twist ending that will not be satisfying, fair warning. So this is the FTC versus MoviePass in 2011, MoviePass launched the subscription service that allowed consumers to view movies at their local theaters for a monthly fee. Between 2011 and 2017, MoviePass offered a variety of subscription plans at different price points, which were generally sold through a negative option in which consumers continued to pay a monthly fee for the service unless they affirmatively canceled their subscriptions. In August of 2017, respondents relaunched the MoviePass service nationwide, offering consumers unlimited movie views viewings for $9.95 a month, again sold as a negative option. Respondents expressly marketed the service A as offering unlimited movies for only $9.95 a month, and as providing access to any movie, any theater, any day, all major movies in all major theaters. The way they did this, if I recall correctly, they issued you like a debit card, and the debit card would only work when you went into the app and you were nearby a theater and you selected a showtime and it authorized the charging of the 10 or 12 whatever dollar fee for that movie and again i think they actually had to pay the full price to the movie theater because they had no deals they were hoping that people who didn't use their subscription would subsidize the people who did and i think that was a terrible bet maybe if it was 20 dollars a month but, you know, there's graphs, there's lines on the graph that cross, there's a supply and demand curve. As the cost goes up, the demand will go down. Maybe they thought that $10 a month was the appropriate magic price point. And as allowing consumers to enjoy a new movie every day. Even though I don't think theaters show a new movie every day, they usually cycle them on a couple weeks to couple month basis. Here's a marketing material. Rediscover the magic of cinema, unlimited movies for $10 a month. Any movie, any theater, any day. Movie Pass Unlimited. Respondents had attracted approximately 3.2 million subscribers to Movie Pass by early 2018. By this time, however, corporate respondents were already incurring financial losses due to the cost of the movie tickets subscribers acquired through the service. In an April 2018 filing, Helios expressed substantial doubt about its ability to continue as a going concern and 
a financial update in May 2018 disclosed that it ran an average cash deficit of $21.7 million per month from September to April 2017 to 18. So that backs that up. If they had 3.2 million subscribers times $10 a month is approximately 32 million in revenue per month. If they're then running a deficit of 21.7 million a month, what is that? That works out to be about 53, 54 million dollars. They definitely used the wrong price point. Now, I don't know what the magic price point would have been. If they made it $15 a month, yes, that might have gotten them closer to break even, but only if they kept the 3.2 million subscribers. Some number are going to not subscribe when it's $15 a month. My local movie theater, most of their primetime tickets were about $12 a person. So all I'd have to do is go to one movie and MoviePass would lose $2 a month. So there was some calculation on MoviePass's part that people would either not go to movies as often, even though they would be paying for the service, or that the people in rural areas would go to a $5 movie using, using MoviePass, but people in cities would go to a $15 movie and somehow this would balance out. I don't know. This doesn't sound right in my mind. I, I would like to speak to MoviePass's economists, but whatever. But then, respondents deceptively prevent subscribers from using MoviePass as advertised. In April of 2018, respondents devised and implemented a password disruption and ticket verification feature in tandem to limit frequent MoviePass users' ability to view movies through the service as advertised. Under Respondent's Password Disruption Program, Respondent's invalidated the passwords of the 75,000 subscribers who used the service most frequently while claiming that we have detected suspicious activity or potential fraud on the affected subscribers' accounts. That sounds like fraud to me. It's not even just a violation of a contract. It sounds like they're doing something they're not allowed to do in order to obtain a benefit they're not allowed to obtain. That's that's the basic elements of fraud. So, you know, this sounds like MoviePass fraud to me, really. This representation regarded purported suspicious activity caused one MoviePass executive to advise that it could insinuate that there may have been a data breach and another to advise that it will go on an online forum and suspicions will arise. Were they hacked? Is our data really safe? The password disruption program impeded subscribers' ability to view movies because MoviePass's password reset process often failed. To reset their passwords, they had four steps. Enter an email address, wait for an email, respond to the email, fill out the password reset form. They were unable to do so because the app would not accept their email address. They would never receive a password reset email, and the hyperlink would go to a page not found notification. Indeed, when discussing the password disruption program, a MoviePass executive acknowledged that subscribers using a common smartphone operating system would encounter technical difficulties. When subscribers attempted to contact MoviePass customer service, respondents often responded weeks later or not at all. As a result, subscribers who were required to reset their passwords were unable to reset their passwords in a timely manner. Some of their executives knew of or ordered or helped execute the password disruption program. They were aware of the deceptive nature of the password disruption program. There is high risk that this program would catch the FTC's attention, responded executives. Another executive was concerned about the FTC, which will flame the FTC stuff. So instead, they decided to visit this program upon the top 2% of users. And so the password disruption program as implemented was successful in preventing users from viewing movies with their subscriptions. Then there's the ticket verification program, which required subscribers to take and submit pictures of their physical movie ticket stubs for approval through the MoviePass app within a certain time frame. Only tickets accepted by the automated system qualified as properly submitted and the program terms warned that subscribers whose pictures were not verified would not be able to view future films until they uploaded the photo, and that subscribers whose pictures were not verified more than once would have their subscriptions canceled. So this was a program to both prevent people from getting another movie and then also cancel it was it was false premises for canceling people's MoviePass subscription if they were a frequent user. 
respondents imposed the ticket verification requirement on the top 20% of subscribers, approximately 450,000 consumers were told they were randomly selected. When you select the top 20%, that is not a random selection. The ticket verification program obstructed thousands of subscribers' ability to use the MoviePass subscription. The automated ticket verification program often did not function on certain operating systems. The program software failed to recognize pictures of ticket stubs, and respondents were unable to handle the volume of customer service complaints, which left subscribers' complaints unresolved. The executives knew of this program and implemented it knowingly. They were aware that it was deceptive. When a MoviePass executive suggested that they delay an increase of ticket verification as dry powder to reduce ticket purchases for an upcoming major film release, they said, I agree to hold our powder for the film. I, I guess they're talking about like dry gun powder. I don't know. I don't, I don't quite get it. When the executives were advised by another that the ticket verification program would render MoviePass not able to keep up with the complaint volume this weekend, they said they understand. They tracked the program's effect on subscribers and anticipated the reduction in usage the program would cause. It prevented many subscribers from using their MoviePass in compliance with their terms of use. Then they implemented tripwires. They devised another program to prevent frequent users from viewing one movie per day, as respondents had advertised, undisclosed financial thresholds that respondents referred to as tripwires. To implement tripwires, respondents placed subscribers into groups based on how frequently they used MoviePass. Respondents assigned a dollar allotment to each group, so the subscribers in the same group would collectively only be able to purchase a limited number of tickets. Respondents imposed their tripwire on subscribers who viewed more than three movies per month using MoviePass, far fewer than the one movie per day limit that MoviePass represented when marketing. Subscribers were unaware that they had been placed in these groups. So you can do all of this if you put it in your contract and make your users aware that you're doing this. Even if it's in your contract and maybe people just click a checkbox, uh, not legal advice, you're going to want to talk to an attorney specializing in like click wrap or browse wrap agreements because it has to be something that's that's close enough and, and meets all the requirements for the user to understand they're agreeing to something. But if you put it in there properly and do all of that properly, yeah, you can have these sorts of limitations. But it is a little hard to maintain an advertisement that says you can watch one movie per day and then have people not able to watch one movie per day. If it said one movie per day in asterisk CR terms, and then you read the terms and it says up to three movies a month. So one per day means you can see one, two, three days, and then that's it. If that's what it said, then yeah, maybe they can get away with this underhanded fraud, but uh, and it's not. It's not in there, so they're doing it without telling people and that's not just shady, that's, that's flat out misrepresentation to gain an undeserved advantage, and that's fraud. Once a given group hit its tripwire threshold, respondents denied access to the MoviePass service. Subscribers affected by the tripwire would be unable to use the service when they attempted to use it, often having already traveled to a movie theater intending to use the service. The executives helped execute the tripwire program. The tripwire program was deceptive and they understood that. Lowe said, the beauty of the cap was that heavy users compete against heavy users for tickets. There but there wasn't supposed to be competition. Uh, I, can't, I can't imagine Netflix saying that you have to stop watching Netflix because you used it too much. I, I, I guess I can imagine it, but it would be pretty bad. The following week, Lowe corresponded regarding tripwire related complaints. We do have our hands tied as far as an explanation goes. We do not want to tell them they've consumed too much. These users are under the assumption that they're uncapped, so it's going to be tricky coming up with the right wording. Respondent's tripwire program prevented many subscribers who were using their MoviePass in compliance with its terms from viewing movies with their MoviePass subscription. So it was a successful program. So then the FTC goes into the law. There's the Restore Online Shoppers Confidence Act, which prohibits charging consumers for goods or services sold in transactions affected through the internet 
through a negative option feature unless the seller clearly and conspicuously discloses all material terms, obtains the consumer's express informed consent before making the charge, and provides a simple mechanism to stop recurring charges. So that's a consumer protection law I was not aware of, the Restore Online Shoppers Confidence Act, the ROSCA. Clearly and conspicuously disclose all material terms, obtain consumers' express informed consent, and provide a simple mechanism to stop recurring charges. I wonder if this could be used against those companies that require you to call to cancel, but then they intentionally make the call to cancel more difficult, which I would say is not a simple mechanism. So you've signed up over the internet, but you have to call to cancel, and calling to cancel means you reach a non-automated cancellation system where a person in a phone queue makes you wait for a long time, often half an hour or 45 minutes or more, before you can reach the person to then cancel. Meanwhile, they will also try to stop you from canceling. I remember when I was doing this with Sirius XM, you could call them and tell them you wanted to cancel, they give you like six months for free. So you could call and try to cancel, they give you six months for free, then six months later you call and cancel, they usually give you more time for free as well. You could get like a lot of time with Sirius XM. I eventually did cancel it because I just wasn't really using it. I can use my phone to listen to podcasts and things now rather than a streaming radio service where I can't really select the song that I want. The telemarketing sales rule, the TSR, defines a negative option and respondents advertised and sold subscriptions through a negative option as defined by the TSR. So it was in violation when it didn't clearly and conspicuously disclose all material terms, obtain the consumer's express informed consent. Uh, they probably did provide a simple mechanism to stop recurring charges, though I don't remember what I had to do to cancel MoviePass. I seem to recall it was difficult, but that might have not been the hardest part. I think it was those first two that were being violated. Then we have violations of the FTC Act. Respondents represented that consumers who purchase a movie pass subscription would be able to view one movie per day at their local theaters, could use it to view any movie in any theater at any time, and of course they could not do so. So that's a violation of the Act. And then the violations of the ROSCA. Yeah, they failed to clearly and conspicuously disclose all material terms and obtain informed consent because they weren't properly informed. They also had a data breach, it sounds like. Failure to take reasonable measures to secure consumer data. They collected significant amounts of personal information. MoviePass made representations about its data security practices. It takes information security very seriously, uses reasonable administrative, technical, physical, and managerial measures to protect personal details from unauthorized access. Further represented that it stores email addresses in an encrypted form. Lowe was responsible for this. And then there was a data breach. On August 22nd, 2019, they acknowledged it a security vulnerability that exposed subscriber records. MoviePass found that certain personal information had been exposed for months from April to August of 2019. The breach exposed a server containing unencrypted personal information. Name, credit card, expiration date, billing address, first name, last name, postal address, email address, birth date, gender, geolocation, user reviews, and movies attended. The exposed server was accessed several times from countries where the company does not operate. The breach was made possible by respondents MoviePass and Lowe to take reasonable steps to protect consumers' personal information. They engaged in a number of practices that failed to provide reasonable security for consumers' personal information. They stored passwords and personal information and financial information in clear text. They failed to assess the risk of personal information being stored on its network. They did not conduct periodic risk assessments. They failed to maintain security controls. They failed to provide adequate security training. They failed to implement safeguards to detect anomalous activity. And so they're also charged with failing to take reasonable measures to protect consumer data. So great, MoviePass is going down, except that they've already declared bankruptcy and are pretty much gone down. And then the FTC announces on the same day as the complaint, they announce the settlement. So this was one of those, like when YouTube got hit with the COPPA complaint, they had already been hit with it, they had already settled it, and then the public side of it was announced. So now the FTC is announcing that they have settled with MoviePass. Let's see what's in here. 
The operators of the MoviePass subscription service have agreed to settle FTC allegations that they took steps to block subscribers from using the service as advertised while also failing to secure personal data. Under the proposed settlement, the parent company Helios and Matheson Analytics and their principals, Mitchell Lowe and Theodore Farnsworth, so those were the principals, maybe not the executives, but the, the principals, which they also have executive functions, will be barred from misrepresenting their business and data security practices. In addition, any business controlled by MoviePass, Helios, or Lowe must implement comprehensive information security programs. So. So far, I don't see any money exchanging hands there, but if those companies or low do open up a new company and they don't have comprehensive information security programs, then they're also in violation of this agreement. And I guess money damages would be a lot more. MoviePass and its executives went to great lengths to deny consumers access to the service they paid for while also failing to secure their personal information. The FTC will continue working to protect consumers from deception and ensure that businesses deliver on their promises. In its complaint, FTC alleges that MoviePass, along with its CEO, Lowe, as well as Helios and Farnsworth, CEO of Helios, deceptively marketed its one movie per day service promised to subscribers who paid for its $10 monthly service. The FTC alleges that MoviePass employed three tactics to prevent subscribers from using the service. MoviePass operators invalidated subscriber passwords while falsely claiming to have detected suspicious activity. MoviePass operators launched a ticket verification program to discourage use of the service and MoviePass operators used tripwires that blocked certain groups of users from using the service after they collectively hit certain thresholds based on their monthly cost to the company. The commission's complaint details how Lowe and Farnsworth were personally involved in this scheme. I gotta stop doing that. Lowe and Farnsworth were personally involved in this scheme. Lowe is alleged to have personally ordered subscribers' passwords to be disruptive. The complaint alleges that an employee sent an email on Farnsworth's behalf proposing a misleading consumer notice about the password disruption. MoviePass operators also violated the Rosca Act, requiring that firms be truthful with consumers. And they failed to live up to the requirements of that act. They failed to take reasonable steps to secure personal information and follow their privacy policy. Lowe, Farnsworth, MoviePass, and its parent company are all bound by the proposed order. Under the proposed order, MoviePass operators are prohibited from misrepresenting the services they provide and must implement a comprehensive security program requiring them and any business controlled by MoviePass, Helios, or Lowe to identify external and internal security risks and take steps to address those risks. Finally, MoviePass operators are required to notify the FTC of any future data breaches and a senior executive must certify annually that MoviePass operators are complying with the data security requirements of this settlement. The order does not include monetary relief for consumers. The order does not include monetary relief for consumers. Both MoviePass and its parent company have filed for bankruptcy. The commission voted three to one to issue the administrative complaint and to accept the proposed consent agreement. Commissioner Noah Joseph Phillips voted no and issued a dissenting statement. The FTC will publish a description of the consent agreement soon. Let's take a look at this proposed order and the dissenting statement. So this is the proposed consent order, which seems to just prevent misrepresentations and data security practice violations. And there doesn't appear to be any monetary relief for consumers, as they said. Let's take a look at the dissenting statement. Dissenting statement of Noah Joseph Phillips. The commission's decision in this case to plead a novel theory of liability accomplishes nothing for consumers and reduces clarity for businesses seeking to follow the law. Congress enacted ROSCA to prevent consumers from aggressive sales tactics on the internet. In doing so, it expressed particular concern about the practice of reputable online retailers sharing their customer information with third-party sellers. Consumers didn't know what they were being charged for and had no way to stop the recurring charges. Congress found that these sales tactics undermined consumer confidence in the internet and harmed the American economy. The crux of the statutory regime set forth in ROSCA is to require disclosures in two particular circumstances. The first deals specifically with post-transaction third-party sellers that unbeknownst to consumers receive consumers' financial information and charge them for goods or services. I don't know if that's what's happening here. The second circumstance is when any seller uses a negative option feature, one of the aggressive tactics that Congress found third-party sellers employed. Roska requires specific upfront disclosures. We went over that. 
In selling its services to consumers, MoviePass used a negative option feature. Consumers interacted directly with MoviePass and were aware that they were purchasing a service from MoviePass and were agreeing to recurring charges. Liability here is instead predicated on the fact that when it became apparent its business model was not working because some consumers were going to too many movies, MoviePass began throttling high volume users and potentially reducing their ability to screen movies on a truly unlimited basis and failed to disclose this to new consumers. This is deception and it violates Section 5 of the FTC Act, but the complaint also fashions MoviePass's failure to disclose affirmatively that it would throttle certain high volume users of its service, etc. The novelty here is that for the first time, the commission is treating a deception about characteristics of an underlying product as a violation of Rosca. To date, all of the complaints filed by the commission that allege Rosca violations in the negative option contract with a first party seller have involved defendants hiding a negative option feature, not obtaining express informed consent before charging the customer or failing to provide simple mechanisms for cancellation. For example, in FTC versus Triangle Media, consumers were offered a free trial, but were charged as much as $98.71 for the free trial, and also were enrolled in a negative option continuity plan without their consent. Defendants also used deceptive order confirmation pages to trick consumers into ordering additional products for which the defendants similarly charged consumers full price and enrolled them in negative option plans. The defendants then made it difficult to cancel. So. So far, I'm not seeing anything here about how this settlement is terrible because it's harmful to consumers and doesn't have any remedy that charges MoviePass and its founders with anything like a monetary penalty when they basically committed criminal fraud, in my opinion. So I'm disappointed so far in the dissenting opinion as well. The commission is thus announcing that it may seek civil penalties against all businesses that use online negative option features where the commission determines that there has been any material deception. Well, what do you think informed consent means? It, he even, he puts it in his own dissent. They must clearly and conspicuously disclose material terms. Okay, so if you've altered the terms, then that's not disclosing material terms. And then you must obtain express informed consent before charging the financial account. They didn't just get consent, they had to get informed consent, which means you must be informed of those material terms. And if you're, if you movie pass are changing the terms, then you are violating an express informed consent requirement. I'm disappointed in this dissent. So there, so he's saying that they have extended the law when they didn't used to do so. There's nothing in here that says he's disappointed in the settlement. So I'm disappointed in the dissent. Uh, I'm disappointed in the settlement and I'm disappointed in the dissent, but that's what it is. MoviePass violated various laws, the FTC Act, probably civil and criminal fraud for making a misrepresentation in order to obtain an unauthorized benefit reducing the unlimited nature of their program and doing so with two or three different deceptive programs. Smacks of fraud to me. Anyway, let me know your thoughts and disappointments in the comments below. If you think that this is a good thing, I mean, one could definitely argue that the companies have been bankrupt for at least a year or two. So what's the big deal? They're not going to squeeze any more blood from the stone anyway. So at least they got a settlement that includes future liability if there are future violations. But it also sounds like Lowe and Farnsworth. Is it Farnsworth? Yes, it's Farnsworth. It's Mitchell Lowe and Theodore Farnsworth. And they seem to have gotten away scot-free aside from the bankruptcy of their respective corporations. So I guess bankruptcy of your corporation is a bad thing, but they certainly got personally paid for making these fraudulent decisions. I don't know. Let me know what you think in the comments below. 
Thanks for watching. This channel would not exist without your support on patreon.com slash ljfrench, sponsors.com slash law, float plane subscriptions, and YouTube memberships. Special thanks in the month of June to the following supporters, Joe Tyson, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, EV, Spirit Bear, Benjamin Hightoff, Ugly Grill, Rudolph Becherer Jr., Torpedon, Brandon Abel, Shadow Tycho, Earthbound Star, RDH Dragon, and Pure Magma. And thank you to the rest of our supporters scrolling on the screen in front of you. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. I love you all. I'll see you in the videos. Have a great week. Bye. I'm not gonna touch your baby, I promise. There used to be a way that I could highlight without, yeah, I don't. Now,